He's so. Oh, all right. Guess I'm, try, guess I'm gonna try again. Angela, Angela, do you want to make me co-host with Paul so you can leave us? No, oh, I have to do that actually. Oh, you have you host. Okay. Yeah, so I can do that. I'll, I'll make Sean and you co-host. Just okay. a heads up. I'm I'm gonna try to leave at 9:45 unless there's a quorum issue because I have a, a okay another meeting if I want to make. Right. Okay. I see Alicia is in the outside poll. We have to bring her in. Okay. I'm not. Oh, I am co-host now. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. Mike said he was going to be a few minutes late. And here is Mike. Okay. Not too late. <laughs> okay. So Angelica, right so Angelica can't make it and um, Phoebe can't make it. Just I just got heard from Phoebe something came up. And Allison said she'd be joining late because I believe this is first day of school. Mike is second day of school. Second day. Second day of school, all right. So she said, so I'm just counting one, two, three, four, five, six. We, we, oh, Tammy is here. Okay, we have a quorum. So I will start the meeting. Uh, good morning, everyone. It is Friday, August 26, and this is the elementary school building committee meeting. And seeing we have a quorum, I'm going to call out the members' names to make sure everyone can hear and be heard. Paul? Present. Jonathan? Present. Sean? Here. Mike? Here. Tammy? Here. Simone? Here. And Alicia? Here. Welcome, everyone. Um, I think we'll, it, I, Sean said he, let me see, it's, is it, Eight, not quite 8.30 yet? It's 8.34. 8.34, okay, my uh, sturdy watch is five minutes wrong. Uh, okay, so um, Sean said he needs to leave a bit early, so I'm worried about losing a quorum, and I see Rupert and Ben are not here yet. So I will make sure um, to announce them when they appear, but I think we'll start, Margaret. So if you want to uh, just do a quick review of the agenda. And um, I, Angelica asked me um, about the schedule looking forward. So I'm going to send that out again to everyone, but we'll try to post it on the project website and also the main sheet of um, the committee. So if people yeah. lose their schedule, they'll, have, they'll at least know what days we're meeting. Um, you know, Kathy, a great minds think alike. So I was thinking the same thing. I think we're going to put it on the landing page of the website so that anybody who's like, I don't remember when the next meeting is. And I do have it to quickly pull up here this morning. So thank you. Okay. So um, we're going to focus today on looking at some, I'm sure, very exciting work on the building and site plans. Um, starting to talk about materials and elevation studies, recap the net zero presentation, the, the daylight discussion of the net zero meeting. And Sean, I don't think there are any invoices to look at today, correct? No, I don't have any. Yeah. So hopefully we can make sure we get through all that before you have to go. So just quickly for everybody to toggle um, the the content of these meetings has moved around a little bit, so don't focus on the content. Um, but the what I wanted to point out is the next uh, two months are kind of super important in terms of the amount of content that's going to be uh, presented. And as a reminder, we have a meeting on the 16th of uh, September, the 30th, the 14th. And at that point, believe it or not, we're doing estimates for schematic design. So uh, it, I, it, 
we just want to say I reserve the right that we may need to interject another meeting if we've got more content than we're getting through, but that's the plan at the moment. Okay. So I'm going to turn it over to the Dinesco team. Okay, Tim. Uh, one second, I'll share my screen. And Kathy, just to note, Ben is here now. Uh, ben, um, I'll just make sure you can hear and be heard. Welcome. Thank you. I believe I can be heard, right? <laughs> You're good. Thanks. Okay, um, the way the presentation is laid out, uh, despite the agendas that we were going to start with um, exterior material examples and precedents and have a discussion about other buildings. Um, and just so we can have a conversation and get a sense and feel of what your thoughts on are, how the building is going to look, what it's going to be made of and what the experience is of. And we can build upon the site visits that we've had so that some of you saw the materials and construction of other elementary schools. Uh, but we also have photos of many of our and other architects buildings. So we can understand what uh, what you're feeling before we start the whole design process. These are uh, photographs of Hastings School, which we visited. Uh, the palette has various materials and that many times Donna and Vivian will jump in, uh, but uh, this is uh, mainly brick. There are uh, ground face CMU panels, uh, windows in the classrooms with accents of metal panel and curtain wall. Uh, you can see the entry that is covered by a canopy uh, with uh, structural steel, um, large expanses of glass at circulation and at the gymnasium, and then also accents of other brick colors within the masonry. Um, I would like uh, this to Jonathan. be a discussion, so I'm gonna, yeah. gonna call on Jonathan, yeah. It did, just for it, um, Folks who who didn't get to go on the on the tours or or ne don't necessarily have um, you know my experience with different building materials, it might be good uh, on some of these slides to just kind of point out. I mean, I think brick is fairly obvious to people, but like the the the, the metal panels or the mm -hmm. other kind of um, kind of rain screen materials we're going to see later, you you might want to just kind of with the cursor note what they are so that folks can kind of differentiate. Sure, absolutely. Tim, Thank you. Tim, if I could, um, I'm happy to interject and talk a little bit about Hastings and why we used some of these materials. Um, and I'll just keep it brief because we've got a bunch of slides. So on Hastings, we um, wanted to evoke kind of the, the traditional school feel with the traditional red brick. This looks much more orange than it is in real life. So um, it's also a very large building. It's 110,000 square feet really a, a little long when you look at it sideways. So we wanted a way to break up that really long form. So with the brick, we have I mean, uh, ground face CMU. So on the lower right hand corner under the canopy right back there is ground face CMU. And it's a very durable material that is very cost effective as well. Really nice. And for those of you who went on the tour, we like to use that on the interior of a gym as well. So there's no maintenance in terms of having to repaint these surfaces and they, they hold up very well. And then on the left hand side photo on the lower yeah, right where Tim's cursor is, that's a porcelain rain screen product. Um, not inexpensive, but very durable as well and really holds up well. Um, you know, our concern is if there's graffiti or, or marking or dirt it really is easy to clean and also easy to replace because it's a very modular system and then finally we use metal panel kind of sparingly it 
you know, when we use it, we are very careful not to bring it all the way to the ground because it's not the most durable. It gets hit. If there's snow, snow blowers or snow clearing, it just wouldn't hold up. So we always try to create a base of some sort and usually the ground face CMU. And then, and then I guess I just also want to just kind of point out that we can do different types of design or features to break up the scale. You can see the CMU, right? We, we've modified, there's texture to it and yeah. same thing with the bricks. So um, we can get creative and I think we have some other slides that will show, you know, it doesn't have to be just a solid face that we can in a cost-effective way, try to accentuate or break down the scale of the building. Kathy? Um, yeah, uh, so as you go through these, one of my questions, um, you've used the word cost-effective and inexpensive or ex more expensive, um, is varying it. So on these pictures, we have one, to at least three different kinds of material and three different bricks, if I'm looking at three different bricks. So does that increase the price of the exterior by going from a red brick to a darker red brick to a yellow brick? And, you know, so it's, so just giving us a sense that if we do one variation, but use it more carefully, um, so, so that's, did, I, I'm just trying to be, and, and I don't want to lose durability and I don't want to lose maintenance. So, you know, easy to maintain, durable, and the metal probably has some feature, feature to it that's useful. So, so that's my question. If you can point that out a little bit to us as we, as you go through these. So, sure. so with the brick also, there are different size bricks that have different price points with um there's so many things that factor into the price and Jonathan can probably talk more about that as well but um we used a Norman size brick which is longer than your typical modular brick so in terms of putting it up it took a little less time so by nature of that that saved a little bit of money by breaking up the pattern of the brick and having you know the ins and outs to create a little bit more texture that adds a little bit more to the unit cost. But when you're looking at a building of this size, it really is not effective. It, it doesn't really factor in. It's kind of an average price. Does that? Yeah, I hope that helps. And go ahead. No, I was just going to add to that that there is a difference between colors and materials and there is a little bit more labor in terms of the core bling and the texture, but none of that brings the brick, let's say, to the price of some of the other materials. I mean, each material family has a general cost. Uh, brick is probably the most cost effective of what you see here. The curtain wall is the most expensive. Mm -hmm. or, uh, the panel and the porcelain are in between those. I would imagine with this, the porcelain is closer to the curtain wall than the brick and the yes. panel is somewhere in between, probably a little lower than the, the porcelain. And then, and then Tim, um, just for lay people here, the CMU, right, is, is in the same family as brick. So we call it out differently yeah. as a different material, but it's still within the brick family. So that's the, um, durable kind of grayish color that's under the canopy on the bottom photo and then in the upper right um, we accentuate the those are the kindergarten classrooms right they have to be a yep. little bit deeper so okay. when we say brick it's brick it's ground it's a ground face cmu um and you I guess, you know, when you look at it closely, you go, wow, this has texture. This is really nice. You, it has speckles in it. They're different colors. It's different. So, um, but when you stand back and you take a look at it, it really, you, you don't see the detail in it. So it's mm -hmm. kind of interesting how you, it's not just the color or the material, but also the texture and, and how we um, try to accentuate so um, I just want to sort of chime in at a very simplistic level, and Danisco team, tell me if you disagree. So 
the masonry materials are the least expensive and CMU, the ground face block that they're talking about is the lowest of the masonry. And then there's sort of gradations of the brick. And then above that are these, you know, these other materials. So I think what's really clever about the Hastings building is the way they've used the masonry materials predominantly used the more expensive materials as accents and use the most mm -hmm. durable of the masonry materials where you needed the most durability. Yeah. Good summary. Good summary. Yeah. We have uh, a bunch of projects to look at, so maybe we'll move yeah, to the next. Yeah, let's keep going. Uh, this is the other project that we saw in August, um, Sunita Williams School. Um, this has a different palette uh, there is some brick that you can see on the back of the school, um, but predominantly uh, it is curtain wall and uh, a phenolic resin panel, uh, which is installed similar to the uh, a modular system like the porcelain that you saw on Hastings. Um, this has accents of composite metal panel as well, and then some masonry, but uh, I, I believe, and I'm pretty sure this is uh, a different sort of uh, veneer um, applied, yeah. uh, almost like a tile system. Um, in terms of relative cost, um, the same logic applies as at Hastings Brick is at the low end. Curtain wall is the most expensive and the phenolic resin panels are uh, at the higher end, closer to the curtain wall, but not quite as much. And then uh, with phenolic resin panels, there are opportunities for applying different texture surfaces, veneers. Um, so this, which looks like wood, um, is a lot more durable, a lot more color fast, um, yeah. and uh, more friendly for maintenance. So, so Tim, just to put it in perspective, this would be like the metal panel. This would be more like the porcelain. It just trying to help people understand. It would be in the range of metal panel or porcelain. Uh, okay. I'm not. Yeah, and and so just so everyone understands, it's it's not an inexpensive material, but this was the preference. Also, um, this was an hour school. This was another architect just. And Margaret, you were gonna swing by one school. This um, um, material really just started coming back or started being used, what, about 15 years ago? So, <laughs> um, you know, some, some of the concerns with some, there's some other schools that had started using it maybe about 10 years ago. I'm trying to think when Bancroft opened, but, um, you know, who wants who wants to be the first to see how how does it fade does it hold up but margaret did you have a chance to swing by that building yesterday i wasn't able to stop because there was some sort of em emergency going on but i will show you if i can picture of the finish and Rupert, Rupert's you have a question. A question. Yeah. Rupert's yeah. got a, and, and Margaret, if you do that, their screen will have to come off. So yeah, maybe. you know what? I I should. This isn't. A, I'm just looking at Google, looking at the picture of it from Google Earth, and this isn't a great picture. But Donna, I will get some pictures for you. Yeah. So I worked in a nutshell. I worked on a project where it was used right at the beginning. I had told Donna I would go by and take a picture of how it was holding up. So well, that that'll have to be a follow up. Rupert, go ahead. Okay. Oh, I, I just had a question about the phenolic resin panel. I'm not so familiar with that. Uh, how is that attached? Is that like with screw type fasteners into a metal framing? That is attached with a backup system like a, uh, like a um, rain screen system similar to uh, there is a system of Gertz metal framing that is on the exterior of the sheathing and then the panels are fastened to that. So with it outside of the exterior sheathing and air barrier, there is an insulation layer. And in that insulation layer is the framing for the panels that are then either face fastened or clipped, depending on the system to the backup wall. Um, and just, can uh, I just, uh, as a follow up, sure. um, in terms of uh, maintenance, if a panel gets damaged, uh, do you have experience with the replacement on those phenolic panels? How that works? 
depending on the system, they are either face fastened or clipped in, but they are replaceable. Yeah. Rick, did you have something? Yeah, to I add? just wanted to say, as you started talking about the backup for veneer masonry, for porcelain, for mm -hmm. uh, metal panel, the basic exterior wall closure system is consistent. Uh, it's the steel studs, uh, sheathing, air and vapor barrier, uh, spray foam on the backside of the sheathing. So with each articulation of different material type, the backup construction doesn't change. Yeah. So it's really modulating the surface treatment. Uh, so that what I'm trying to say is that difference in materials doesn't translate all the way through to the interior. So it, it's it's really uh, arranging the the colors and textures on the surface of the box, if you will. So that's where the differences in costs are. Thank you. And then just in terms of the masonry, uh, are all of those uh, grouted and do they need periodic regrouting? Or are there some exceptions to the typical brick? The typical brick would not need repointing for a very long time. I mean, this is the lifetime of the building building material. Thank you. This is another one of our projects. It's an elementary school in Wooper. Uh, this has, in addition to the brick and CMU, the we've seen in various colors on other projects. This also has a single skin metal panel, uh, which is the green color between the windows on the left. And you can also see it in some of the right images. So the, um, the, uh, the difference between this and some of the other metal panels that you've seen is that it's uh, a single layer of metal and the Insulation is not within the panel itself. Uh, there are various versions that have insulation in the panel, uh, a, a polyethylene layer between and none at all. And that's what this is. And this is the most cost-effective metal panel. Um, it's available in custom colors and which adds cost, but there's a full variety and there's also textures. Here is a modular system of about one foot tall panels with different corrugations in them fit together. This project also has exterior sunshades, which can be used to modulate the facade and then some brake metal, which is simply metal flashing over uh, framed cornices. So um, Tim, I have a um, on or all a whole team. If do these materials have um, different ability to absorb heat or repel heat? You know, when I think of um, the way they build in the Southwest, do they gain solar gain by just the wall gets warmer? You know, it comes in, or is it? They're so far on the outside of the building, it doesn't matter what Rick was saying, that it's just they're attached on the outside. Um, so it's just a question on uh, the brick versus the metal versus the porcelain versus the whatever. And then my second question is, these are kind of open sunshade awnings. I saw some at Amherst College that were, you know, just a single gray piece of metal coming out that I think was just to cut down the drink. So are, are these costly? And would the, when you get to the daylighting with these kind of uh, sunscreens um, and the way we've got the building, there are gonna be classes on the south side. Would that create light patterns inside the classroom? Cause these are open sunscreens. So it's two different questions just on what I'm seeing here. Um, okay, to answer the questions in order, yes, the, the, the materials do have thermal properties that, you know, some are more absorbent, but they, it is true that they are all outside of the insulation and weather barrier. So as Rick was saying, there's a typical wall 
that is behind all of the materials. And then there's a certain amount of insulation. All of these materials are installed outside of that weather and insulation barrier. So the masonry materials have more thermal mass and they will absorb and retain heat. Uh, but that effect is mitigated by all of the materials being installed outside of the installation. And the uh, rain screen materials are in fact vented and yes. have air movement behind them on purpose constantly. So the the skin really doesn't have any effect on the interior. Yeah, the largest in terms of uh, the feeling of heat or heat loss or heat gain is simply the solid wall versus where you have glazing. And then as to the sunshades with uh, intermittent horizontals in them. Um, so they're designed that way because they are designed for specific directions of the sun. When the sun is coming right down, there's no real reason to block it from coming down so it can come outside and bend. But if you're coming in at an angle, um, you know, elevated 45 degrees, 25 degrees, that will block the light going into the window. Um, there will be times when there are striations of light, but they're designed to mostly um, reduce that. But the sun moves um, and then no exterior shading device blocks all of the sun you want all of the time. And yes, they are, um, they are not inexpensive. They, they, they come with a cost premium. Tim, and then the question was the difference between these as opposed to a solid piece. Is there a benefit or a difference? I think that was the other part of the question. Um, the benefit would just be a more complete um, shading system, uh, depending on how the solid shade is manufactured. These ones shown here are um, extruded aluminum. Sometimes they come from the window manufacturer. Um, so they are part of a pricier package. Sometimes the shades, and I'm not, you know, familiar with the ones that you're referring to at Amherst, but they could be part of the system, which would be expensive, or they could be part of the building and constructed in some other more cost effective way. Um, but in general, um, the shades do come with a cost premium. The, also, the solid ones potentially could be part of a system that is like a light shelf. That's an exterior light shelf if there are clear story windows above, right? So they serve potentially to bounce a little bit of light inside. And then the other thing that we've recently seen on a couple of projects is um, some people have actually put PVs on top of right. the shades. Um, of course, I'm sure that's not inefficient or, or that it's very efficient, but that's another way to um, ob obtain PVs and energy. This is another school in Lexington. Um, most of the facade of this is that uh, durable ground faced CMU material in different colors uh, with a pattern. Um, here you can see that the aluminum windows have color. Um, unlike some of the other projects, we also have the exterior sun shades here, deeper, a little more solid. You can see the shadow that they cast on the window. And then here is a, an applied stone material similar to what we saw at the Sunita Williams School. Uh, a curtain wall that is in the spaces at the entry of the building with custom colored mullions. And then uh, a metal panel overhang over the entrance to the building. This is an elementary school in Newton with a different panel um, or a different system of composite aluminum panels and fins at curtain wall. This is a square masonry brick material 
This is a single skin corrugated metal panel, and these are composite aluminum panels. Composite panel around windows and some natural stone at the base. And then these exterior columns have composite metal panel on them. And you can see as we do here, and a lot of our, at the very ground where we can have shoveling, um, snow blowers, all sorts of kids. We have the either precast concrete or ground face CMU for durability. This is the Lexington Children's Place. It's a departure in terms of the color palette and materials. It's a gray brick, um, a single skin metal panel system. Uh, and it, I believe the window boxes are composite metal panel. Is that Rick? right? Um, but this project shows that, you know, in, in terms of color palette, traditional versus whimsical for lack of a better word. There are lots of options um, that you know we can custom tailor to whatever it is you want the Fort River School to be. Um, and so we just want to get your reaction to as much as we can. Yeah. I, I mean, I think just, just to add to that, Rick can comment on the sure. window boxes, but um, we're, we know this is a much smaller school, different field, single story, but um, so we're not necessarily suggesting um, we we we're not suggest it's a totally different size of a building, but we just wanted to just demonstrate that brick, you know, when people say brick, they think they just think of red brick, and we're just showing the possibilities and how we can um, take advantage of it and customize it to to what you think is appropriate for the Fort River School or the new elementary school. Yeah, uh, those window boxes are, Tim, are structural. There are stub beams welded to columns that come out and framed. And basically it's it's a clad box and the, the single skin panel uh, provides color and, and, the, and, the, and the finish. So that's an example where it serves as a shade and as a and as a bezel for the windows, but it's uh, entirely structural. That's that's just clad in color, as if it was a flat wall. And the and again, the panel up above is another treatment of the least uh, costly single skin panel. Uh, this applied horizontally uh, to have a texture like that, uh, like a basic one foot horizontal texture. Here's another um, composition of brick porcelain tile on the exterior, composite metal panel, curtain wall with sun shades. Uh, So also the building material underneath that canopy on the left-hand side are prefabricated porcelain panels that the um, panel folks actually uh, created in the shop and then delivered and they were, it saved time in terms of installing. But there yeah, they was- were, a, They were constructed in a shop uh, just over the main border. They're, they were metal panels uh, or metal stud panels uh, yeah. made in the shop, uh, tiled uh, in the shop by uh, tile masons uh, horizontally on the flat and then trucked out and uh, installed almost as if they were precast concrete. Yeah. And then within the brick here, you can see multiple colors, multiple patterns um, to break up, even though a lot of the brick is within the same plane. We also have a collection of 
buildings that are not ours just to show um, materials that uh, aren't shown so frequently in, in, in those projects um, and different patterns in masonry and proportions of windows. Um, starting at the upper left, there's masonry with uh, windows with metal panel accents. Um, the project in the middle center of the top is a metal panel, curtain wall, and brick. Moving to the right uh, is a surface applied stone product, and we think this is actually natural wood, which would probably not be appropriate, but we um, share these images um, for the aesthetic, and it's also um, potentially replicatable with other materials um, similar to this school, which is not a natural wood product. It's, a, a, I believe, a phenolic resin panel with um, masonry at the base for durability. At the middle and the center is a project with almost entirely um, the single skin metal panel, which can provide interesting colors and textures and accents. Um, and then where the building meets the ground, there are more durable materials. Um, and then this image is a fiber cement panel, which is installed similar to a rain screen or phenolic resin. Um, um, there are many systems with either um, fiber cement, phenolic resin, and there are even terracotta panels that can be installed as units over uh, a similar backup system, uh, depending on the look you're going for or the cost you have for the project. Um, there are a lot of options. So I think that's the Oh, you've got a few more. Oh, okay. the, there's uh, one more just uh, to show a few more contemporary materials of uh, metal shingles, uh, different ways of using brick, um, more contemporary aesthetics with the windows. Um, this is a fiber cement and panel infill. This is a patinaed metal tile. This is uh, a brick with a, a stone base. And then this is uh, various masonry products and a, and a metal panel. But that is it. So I think, he, um, I'm sure your heads are spinning. And it, it, it would be- <laughs> Well, they're beautiful images. What are you proposing to do? <laughs> well, we, we, we did not come with any preconceived ideas. Um, I think what we, heard um, when we were on the tour, um, some people sounded like they were sort of leaning towards more of a traditional um, brick. Others kind of liked the look of Sunita Williams, which was the composite panel that um, looked a little bit more like natural wood. And you know, for us, we might have our ideas just because of the setting and, and the surroundings and your neighbors. Um, you're, you don't have competing neighbors here, right? So you don't have to necessarily worry about any other large buildings that you either want to complement or look totally different to. So really, it's up to you all to help us be informed in in what you like. We understand cost, right? So so um, and complexity. So cost and complexity, we'll get into. But it would be really helpful to hear what you like. What is like making your head spin, like mine and that one in the bottom left. <laughs> um, but but others may say that that's beautiful. Like that's awesome. So it would be how it's it it is subjective. It hundred percent is subjective, but it would be really helpful if you all had any kind of ideas and visions of what you thought the building would look. And, like. and Donna, I think I think that the first small bite is because it sets in motion a lot of the discussions of uh, material selection, color, uh, window patterns, is is your vision of the new school a air quote traditional building or a, or a not traditional building? Uh, 
you know, the traditional buildings that we show tend to be the ground face CMU, which emulates stone at the first floor. So it's it's base stone brick base. Uh, the Sunita Williams uses is a non-traditional, more contemporary uh, look, and it and it uses different materials in in different ways, while still being a kind of a a base uh, shaft type of expression of the verticality. So, how does Amherst visualize their new building? Who wants to go first? <laughs> uh, Rupert. Well, actually, and yeah. I want to suggest another prompt about this discussion. So, yeah. um, which is a, a degree to which people uh, want to reflect the, you know, relative traditional approach of the schools that like the Fort River School that's being demolished, which was a red brick uh, building, right, versus and and also I think Amherst other schools are red brick buildings. So do you is there a desire to sort of align with that or to do something different? That would be another way of thinking about it. Yeah, and I think just also to think about what you're gonna and and this will, you know, once we have a little bit of direction or whatever, we'll start looking at it. But um, it's like the Sunita Williams that you're seeing. It was very long. So when you approach this building, it's enormous, right? You see the the you see the longest facade. Um, when we when you approach the new school, you know that's going to be a, a a very small portion of the. That's sort of I hate to say the end of the building, right? Sort of like Hastings, um, where the the school goes all the way back into so you'll be seeing a small portion as you approach the school to a certain extent, but when you're sitting in the fields and you're sitting in the play area or the site, you'll be looking up at the building. So um, that too can, can play into what you see. And we've even talked about, you know, the front of the building or the entrance could be different than what you see on the sides of the building. Rupert. Okay, um, just a couple of things. I'll try to be brief. On page three, the uh, the stone veneer. Uh, personally, I love that look, but practically, um, I worry a lot about. Um, uh, Line up. Line up. Uh, I worry about um, stinging insects and nests. I'm plagued at some of our schools with with dealing with that, and lots of cracks and crevices seems like an invitation. Um, and the other personal aesthetic that I'll mention is, I think, on uh, page five. Personally, the um, that uh, two-tone brick uh, on the upper right-hand corner, uh, I don't particularly care for. It's just a personal taste. On the other hand, if you look at the uh, the two-tone brick down on um, Page nine, top left photo. Um, that feels so much warmer and more interesting to me. Um, but that's just personal taste. I'll, I'll be quiet now. We don't want you to be quiet. That's who we're asking for. So thank you. Sorry, I'll give somebody else a turn. <laughs> All right, Sean. Yeah, um, I think one thing I've heard before is we just we don't really want it to look like a municipal building. You know, to whatever extent possible, we can. Um, I think brick tends to do that. So I don't know what other options there are besides brick, but um, is it okay if we just send photos to of schools that we know that we sort of like the way they look? Um, I know there's one where I go on vacation a lot that looks like a really nice elementary school. And I don't know if the materials are possible, but yeah, absolutely. I've, I've always, I've always wished I could go to that elementary school, so. Yeah, send them along, Sean, that would be great. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Mike. So I'm going to take the Kathy role today. So maybe I'll I'll help with Kathy. So you know I am concerned about cost. Um, um, I, I'm not settled on red brick, but I do think. Um, well, personally, I like the front. You know, having been there, the Sunita Williams, it's striking uh, when you when you pull up uh, to that school. Um, you know, we're going to be on a, a limited budget, and I'm not sure what the right balance of spending on the exterior materials versus 
the playground, right? Like I, I, I tend to go for functional pieces. And so uh, when Rupert talked about concerns, you know, about uh, some of the materials and the, the impact, right? That, that looms large for me on the practical end of things. Uh, I'm not saying I want it to be the blandest building ever. I just, you know, I, I think cost has to be a feature um, because there's some things that you've all heard me, you know, feel really strongly about in terms of spaces for special needs kids. I think uh, having been to two schools and seeing how they use their money differently, uh, one much more heavily on exterior um, uh, playground area that was used almost year round because it was plowable, right? Like, uh, so that's the balance, right? For me is there's things I like, but then there's things into, in my hierarchy, which is, as Rupert said, it's just mine, right? Uh, I would rather increase our expenditures on things that are functionally used by kids and adults versus more aesthetic features. Um, you know, my wife, again, can tell you lots of details about my thoughts on that uh, and my personal life as well, but it holds consistent. Um, I think the only other thing I wanted to say is one of the feedback pieces we got from MSBA is when you drive up to the school based on the orientation, it's gonna be really important that there's a feature towards the front of the building that makes it really clear where the entrance is and, and the wayfinding. And so as we think about the design, I wonder if we're gonna, you know, in, in an era of limited resources, put more resources into some element, design element, and people are gonna be much better than me at saying it, that, that has aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing and draws the eye that leads people to know exactly where the entrance and exit is uh, because of the nature of coming in off Southeast Street and a building that, that is designed to go sort of back instead of the current orientation of Fort River, which is more side, I, I don't have the right language, but side to side, this one's going more deep. So it becomes more important that that visual um, be clear. So I think for me, I would put, you know, the resources we have for some of the materials into something that that is visually, um, you know, takes your visual attention and also directs folks to know where the entrance is because it may not be abundantly clear based on the orientation of the building. So I'll go back to Rupert and I'll let other people jump in, but that's just my two cents. So I, Kathy, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, just building on all the other comments. Um, we've got, we're gonna see when we see the layout later we've got a long side that you're going to see when the bus loop comes in um the the south side of the building as mike said we've got a a relatively shorter front side and then we've got a south side so um i think it would be helpful in terms of how can we visualize this more if we collect some ideas and I'm willing to send something out as chair, like which color schemes do you like or Sean's idea of taking pictures of some other schools? Cause I, at Amherst College, there's some dark red brick with, it might be the CMU that used those two things. They did it in a geometric pattern that was really interesting um, and not, as busy as what I'm seeing in some of these pictures. So I don't think simple has to be boring is I guess it's the way, and, and these are big buildings that they did it on. So it might be good um, for us to have some 3D pictures of what the school might look like with the floor plan. And so we can see what the face facing of the school is. And then we could click on pictures or things and that's and then I'm going to end there without a clear preference. My my preference is where Mike is. I want it to be inexpensive and durable. <laughs> you know, I, I you know so I you know but but be interesting. Um, so d do those. So then my my last thought is that the community, larger community, may want to weigh in on some of this. Um, teachers, users, parents. So if we got some three D pictures with you just taking a leap and showing us some examples on the side or front of our building, we've got this terrific device that the town has called Engage Amherst that allows people to weigh in and say, you know, I like number one, or we did this with the design of a park, you know, on the color schemes and stuff, but we could get, we could easily just get a broader group to say, you know, the red, dark red brick contrasting with CMO, I really like that, or 
let's be bold and go in another direction. So that's just a thought of how to get more input than just us, the 13 of us. Thank you, Kathy. Oh, Alicia? Um, thank you. So I have a couple of questions. Um, first is that I'm wondering, because I too am concerned about the cost. Um, and so I'm wondering what materials were assumed to have been used when the cost estimates were made. Um, and so where that number originates from. So basically like what our base is. And then I'm also wondering if it's possible to have all of our different options like made into a chart where we can see like this is how durable this one is. This is the cost of this material. So I can look at everything at one time. Um, so I, I, Tim, if you want to chime in about what the basis of design was, the basis of design is probably very similar to Hastings, right? I just unmute yourself. Oh, I was muted. Sorry. The uh, basis of design includes a masonry brick building, as Donna said, very similar to Hastings with accents of um, composite metal panel. Um, and curtain wall and windows, uh, as you see here. Um, so the starting point, if you will, is is this distribution of materials and cost. And yes, uh, as we've described, um, you know, the different materials with their different price points and durabilities, we can put that into a chart. So when we were later evaluating and maybe increasing or decreasing the amount of each material, you can have that as a reference. Thank you, Jonathan. Love what you here. have to say. Yes. So, uh, I, I guess what I would like to suggest is to see what what your ideas are. Um, I think you've presented a, a good palette of of what the options are out there. Um, I do think that the Maria Hastings is a good starting point because I think this facade looks like it's it's within our our cost range, um, but I, I, I'm I'm curious to see where where you would like to take the the exterior aesthetic of the building. It is a, a three story building, so breaking it up um, with different uh, materials as as uh, is is shown in the upper right hand photo um, will be important. Whether we're looking at the building head on um, or or to, at the side. Um, I, I do agree with the MSBA that that having a clear delineation of entry is important. Um, and to touch a little bit on what I know, I think it was Sean said this. Um, you know, not wanting it to look. I think his word was municipal. I think my word would be um, institutional. Uh, but balancing that with it looking like a school, I think it should look like a school. Um, I think. For me, the 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 building that has the the phenolic resin on it um, doesn't quite say school to me in in some ways. While it's warm, um, it 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 doesn't it doesn't feel schoolish, <laughs> for lack of a, a more elegant way to put it. Um, but I, I'm very curious to see you know where where you take it. The, the floor plan itself. Um, as you've presented it so far, has a lot of opportunities for breaking down the form um, from my perspective. So I, I, I'm expecting some, some interesting uh, elevation studies to come out of this process. Um, uh, but uh, I'm curious to see where you're gonna take it. Yeah, we didn't wanna unleash our ideas until we, we heard a little bit more for the direction from you all, um, but Thank you. Well, <laughs> we can have some fun. Tammy? Um, I don't feel like I'm going to reiterate much of what's been said in regards to cost. Um, but one thing I've noticed that people haven't necessarily um, talked about is even though I, I don't live in Amherst, I do know having worked here for long enough that a lot of families really do like that small school feel. And I, I think that some of the residents and staff and students might feel uncomfortable if we have this very like tall institutional looking 
building. So I'm not exactly sure <laughs> that's where your expertise comes in, is to design, design a building that is three stories tall, but still sort of coming into it feels uh, small, small school, and then walk in and, and you can feel the expanse, expanseness expansiveness of it, which which would be lovely. And I think one of the schools we toured had that sort of feel to it. The other thing um, that I feel like I have to say is Amherst is known for our strong stance on anti-racism and social justice. And I really feel like we, and, and inclusivity. So I really feel like there's gotta be that like design element that brings in those cultural influences. Um, so that that's just something that, And I see, that, and that was it, Tammy. Okay, um, Paul. Yeah, I think people are making really excellent points. Um, you know, the, the you know, I am really interested in knowing what your recommendation is. You build schools, we don't. Um, you're looking for our design aesthetic, and I appreciate that. Um, I want I, my goal is that this look like an elementary school. I don't, uh, um, and I think that we want it to read as an elementary school, so it's welcoming to to young children. And, and to a verse, like Tammy said, a diverse group of children that does not uh, that that uh, does not have to reinforce the the sort of uh, normal sort of municipal feel that people are, are identifying as well. Um, I think it's really. I don't think I think we can learn from like our institutional partners at Amherst College and UMass and stuff. But I don't think that really that can help us with looking at what materials look like. But that's not the field that we're looking for. Um, and I think that if you, I guess I'm sort of looking at how we make decisions on this. And if you come back with here are three options, and you know, I think with Alicia said, like price, maintenance, um, you know, and design aesthetic, and, and just get, limit our choices. Um, and next time, I think that's probably your plan. I think that would be very helpful for us. Um, I think opening, you know, we we should welcome people, but I think. <laughs> You know, it's just going to be hard to to get, you know, settle on a design aesthetic. I think because you've got here, you've got nine different people. It could be nine hundred different people. Um, at some point, a decision has to be made, and that's going to be our to, it's going to be our our job to do that, make that decision. Um, so I I like to have a variety, I, but what's important to me is the price and maintenance. Thank you, um, Rupert. All right, I'll jump in again. I just wanted to share with the committee at large. I believe we had a discussion in the net zero about the uh, intermittent horizontal um, sunshades. Uh, and uh, my recollection is that uh, the feeling of our uh, design engineers was that that's more suitable for a Southwest climate than it is for around here. So I'm not sure that that's something that we want to spend a lot of time considering. And then one other comment, um, if you look on say page nine um, in the top left photo, you can see there's a considerable overhang between the first floor ceiling and the second floor rooms. And I just, uh, I, I worry about that as a, as a weak spot for uh, pipes freezing in the winter because there's a, a cold floor underneath what could be a, a heating system. So just to sort of keep in mind that that increases some level of vulnerability and risk when, when we do that kind of stuff. I, I understand there's lots of good reasons to do it. I just wanted to put in a word of caution. Thanks. Mike? It just briefly, uh, one thing I, I wanted to say earlier and I forgot is, well, I don't love the, the gray brick on slide seven of the Lexington Children's Place. I think, you know, I think that's a good example, in my opinion, of like a little bit of whimsy, which is an elementary school. And I think if there are those opportunities that are cost conscious opportunities to, to add some color, I think it really connects to what Tammy said as well. Um, so it doesn't look as institutional and it is uh, connecting more with our student and family population. So, um, I, I, you know, you're all the experts at this. I'm not, but I think, you know, there can be, I was impressed just there's, well, I don't like some aspects of, you know, what it looks like in terms of particularly the gray part, you know, those little bits of color that throughout and, and it, it just, it, it makes it very clear that this is designed for young children. And so I think yeah. even if the bulk of the building, you know, we're going to make some design choices that have some financial elements, I think maintaining that, that kind of where are there elements to add that uh, throughout the building would be really important. 
I think, Mike, you know, what's interesting is this um, LCP, which is their district-wide preschool program, is it's the same as what we were just showing you for the Hastings School, which um, when we were designing that, there was a real desire to make it look like a traditional New England school. So you can see this is the same community with two totally different design approaches, this LCP is nestled in an area where there's um, historic red brick buildings all around it. And so they said, well, how can you compete with those? So it really made sense to di you know, um, take a totally different direction. So it, it different, even it's the same community, look at the two totally contrasting facilities. And so that is why, sure, we could come up with our ideas or concepts, but you really have a important role in at least giving us a little bit of direction because as you can see, this is the same community. We could have gone from Hastings ago, well, you wanted red brick, so we're gonna give red brick here. But instead the conversation at the initial phases was really helpful to understand the direction. Kathy? Yeah, I just wanna, um, I'll retract when I said of the, the broad group. Um, I'm gonna agree with Paul and Jonathan that getting a few variations from you um, and then what Alicia, Alicia said on, you know, some color choices would be very helpful to be thinking this through because you can see that on this slide, they're using color as accent. Um, so the accent would look different if it was against red brick versus um, the CMU substance. And then Mike sent in uh, two photos of these incredible murals um, that are at uh, Fort River now. So if I, when I saw them, I was thinking, okay, we've got a big gym wall without windows on the lower level. One of those murals could go up there. So some of the place the color might come from is those, the, the murals are super exciting. So um, Vivian said, you know, well, in reaction to them is we could, we could look to find a place for them, but just a few and not lots of variations would help with darker red brick against white brick with some color. Um, you know, but not going all the way to white brick and keeping the cost down. So I, I think it just would be really helpful for us to be able to look at a few on the building as we're seeing it, you know, with uh, two long sides and one shorter side, you know, what does the entrance look like? So that I just wanted to go back to Jonathan saying getting because without the building, our building's not going to look like any of these buildings, the actual structure. <laughs> um, so uh, the nearest is Maria Hastings because it's three floors. So you can see that you use different color on each of the three floors of bricks, which was a nice way of making it feel smaller. And I'll stop there, but I, just a few, few variations would be helpful. Yeah, and just a reminder, we've got... Um... Sean for about 10 more minutes. Okay. All right, Jonathan. I, I, just to, to touch a little bit on what Kathy just said, I'm glad she brought up the murals, um, but I also wanted to add to that, we do have a certain percentage for public arts um, and using that public arts uh, you know, judiciously, I think in the, in the public areas of the building, whether that's just outside or just inside or a combination, um, I think that, that that's a way to both touch on um, kind of making it welcoming to the community, welcoming uh, and welcoming to our diverse community, um, uh, and and you know would likely play well with color and and maybe some you know uh, the amounts of glazing to kind of accentuate the entries and and both make the building feel uh, like a like a uh, elementary school um, and and part of the community. Yeah, I think um, we want to definitely incorporate all this beautiful art and you can, um, the original Mariah Hastings had some beautiful um, murals, et cetera. Some of it was on the outside, most of it was on the inside, but 
we do want to be careful not to um, ruin these this art. I, we don't know what it's made of. So we just want to be careful where we locate it. Inside might be more uh, appropriate just to preserve the art instead of being on the outside, or maybe there's an area by the playground that might be covered so that the art doesn't get ruined. But Mike, when we're out there next, we'll absolutely take a look at it and, and see what's the best approach to incorporating it without destroying it <laughs> over time, right? Um, so I think, I know we have a little bit more to talk about. This is really helpful. We appreciate the liberty um, and, and we'll do so. And um, being aware of the cost. And that's why, you know, we did do our basis of design the way we did because the interior is as important as the exterior um, and making sure that we can provide as durable, beautiful inside as we do outside. So we'll, we'll take this liberty to start thinking about it um, and, and coming back once, um, we'll also show you some patterns I think now on the windows, right, Tim? Yes. We have that and the plans to look at. So a large element of the facade and the overall look of the building, um, since you know classrooms make up the bulk of the building are gonna be the repeating elements of each classroom. Um, so there are traditional ways with evenly spaced punched openings and there are more contemporary, some of which you saw on the exterior views. Um, and so we just wanted to have a, a brief conversation if there's any pattern in classrooms that um, affect how the students and teachers use classrooms. Um, um, we know that light higher on the wall brings light deeper and is therefore um, desirable uh, to, to meet your daylighting goals. Um, if there are aspects of the education how it's delivered that they actually use the windows and they need it spread out or they need it all in one place um, and we don't know that that exists but it's um, it's come up in other schools where kids would go to the windows and, and trace things or, or or display things on the window that need light um, but and most importantly it has a, a very significant effect on how the building looks on the outside and how the building performs because um, if we we're trying to achieve that 24% uh, window to wall ratio, um, there's a, a finite amount of glass that we can use in each classroom. And so what we're showing here is uh, different windows in different configurations in different classrooms that um, speak to each of those goals. Um, so here is a, a series of maybe more traditional evenly spaced punched openings. Um, the one in the upper left has glass high and it comes all the way down to two feet. That might be a little bit low because then you can no longer put any shelving in front of it, but you might want that interaction in the classroom or partially uh, at, at one area, we could have the glass low in another area, we could have glass high. Um, and th these are just things that we wanna have in the back of your mind. And particularly if there's anything that the educators have a strong preference on uh, as we're designing the building on the inside and the out. I think Mike has his hand up. Yeah, I mean, I think I have a, a soft preference, I would say it is for windows that students can see the outside landscape from. It's a beautiful site. Um, and so some of these, uh, you know, uh, and I can't speak to the daylighting and which ones work better, but just some of the ones you showed, particularly in the slide before, look like if I'm a student, um, like, yeah, the one on the bottom left, for instance, um, and, I, and I get that there may be other considerations, but, um, you know, I, I think there's natural daylight, but there's also just the ability for students to see that they're connected to the outside world. And I think the upper right, for instance, you know, and I, it may be shaded because of, you know, the, the orientation it's facing, right? There's lots of design elements that I'm not privy to, but I, I like when people can see the outside world. I like when uh, particularly our students from their vantage point can see the outside world. We're designing it, the building primarily for them. And so, you know, I, I like aspects where they get to see, you know, sort of a panoramic, as much as a panoramic view as they can, instead of kind of 
little slices of the outside world because I, I just think it, it, it has a positive impact on uh, on how people view their indoor space. So that's my two cents, but I'll defer to whatever Tammy says because she spends more time at Fort River than I do by a lot. Great, thank you, Mike. Um, I guess what I would say is I agree with Mike and in my own classroom, um, trying to utilize as much natural light as possible and refraining from using um, the overhead, including bringing in my own my own lighting, which I probably shouldn't say, right, over, um, because I, I found that students are just just feel a lot more comfortable in that regard. However, what I noticed in visiting the schools is that even though um, the sorry, even though um, some of the classrooms had these big expansive windows, they ended up having to use the shades. So even though they might have these beautiful landscapes outside, students weren't actually able to see them because of the way the natural light was pouring in, whether it was causing an increase in heat or just too much glare, I don't know. So I, I, I think that also has to be a consideration is how to design the window to wall ratio, great sixth grade math there, um, but uh, to allow for as much natural light where teachers and staff don't feel like they have to close the shades. Yeah, we agree, Tammy. And, you know, once the shades are down, they're down, right? Like it just, um, it's just not a priority. So most of the classrooms are going to be north or south facing. So the north will have um, light that won't have as much glare. And then we're going to have to treat the south side um, to make sure that we don't get the glare coming in, but that we do allow for the natural light. So so there is going to be that balance and then trying to achieve daylighting. And um, I think that will, well, I'll save that because Tim, Tim, Tim will talk about the daylighting in a second. Those are the images that we had for um, classroom windows. We can get back to the daylighting in a minute, but we do want to quickly go through the plans. Um, just as a refresher, we're just going to quickly throw on the screen where we were. This was PSR iterations that we've seen in the past couple of meetings that have moved items around a little bit. And then we had some very productive meetings with the special education staff and Rupert and Ben about how the building is going to function from a service point of view that have pushed the plans around a bit more. Um, and so we're going to zoom in a little bit and talk about some of the changes that we've made. We've uh, condensed the footprint a little bit. Um, front and center is administration and the entrance, which is eroded to the north so that when students are dropped off at the bus loop, as you'll see on the site plan in a minute, they can see the entrance clearly. And then there is another entrance for students that are coming from the southern bus loop. As you approach the building from the west, you will be able to see the volume of the gym and the lower volume of the administration suite that'll help break down that we can talk about when we get into exterior views and the site plan. Um, and then the main space as you enter um, has all of the common areas um, adjacent to each other and off of one wing space, which is you know going to be the study of or the focus of a lot of the study, how we can actually shape this space and make it um, beautiful. Cafeteria opens to the gym and then there's into the academic areas on the first floor. Um, through discussions with the special educators, we have relocated the ILC and the AIM so that there are two stacks um, that uh, service this whole school in a more efficient way. Um, I should mention that there's a, security point that can close off the academic wing from the main space. And then previous iterations had an exit here, which was next to the service area and speaking to Rupert and Ben. Um, there are somewhat frequent deliveries. Um, so we'd like to separate that and bring it closer to the building. And also is gonna make the drop off loop work a little bit better as mostly when we get to the site plan. Jonathan, you have a question? Just a quick one, uh, and maybe it'll maybe it'll be clearer when when you uh, go to the site plan. But uh, you've got 
two kind of entries for students shown, but they, they don't feel very equal to me. Um, is that one next to the gymnasium intended as a day-to-day -day, uh, entry point, just as, as the one which would be to the uh, west is? Or is that just as, kind of like cafe, I mean, uh, recess kind of entry exit? Uh, the main entrance is to the west, and we can talk about it when we get to the site plan. Um, this uh, space, the you know, this sort of looks like a corridor you're right now, and I think that gets massaged a little bit, so it's probably a little bit bigger. Um, the other point of having an entrance here is the gymnasium will probably be the most used public space, um, and if there's direct access to it in a vestibule there, getting in and out of that space uh, allows for the most opportunity to get people in and out without going anywhere else in the building where there's opportunity for them to be places that they shouldn't be. Not that it wouldn't be secure and locked, but in and out as quick as possible is a, a good thing if you're renting the space. And then, and then just to add to that, Jonathan, um, the nurse we're thinking would also have kind of a direct access. And when you see the site plan, you know, we're, we're starting to identify, can we have some parking there, whether it's for um, the school vans that um, the students require a little more time or um, parking for a short period of time, they parent could come and grab their student out of the nurse without having to go all the way around. But um, the other thing too is, and we'll have to, we haven't had all of the conversations with the um, district or the, or the staff, but we also see the cafeteria as maybe being a point of entry. So kids could gather on the play area that is directly outside the calf and then they would come in. So um, yes, we, we would definitely want to treat the entrance it's not really an entrance it's an entrance in the morning for the students when they arrive by bus to be something that's very warm and welcoming and that would be the way that they would exit um, so that we can separate the students those that are going to the cars could maybe conjugate in the cafeteria or something and then they could go that way and the kids are catching the buses could hang out in the gym and then they would leave that way so but yes, we would have to make that a very warm welcoming, but we don't want that to be the prompt. We want the main entrance by the green to be the like yeah. main entrance. And then the only other thing I wanted to respond to when we were working with the special needs folks, we're also um, trying to accommodate MSBA's or DESE's comments about making a couple of the spaces more aligned with the general classroom spaces. So just wanting to throw that out there too, that we're doing this in addition to address MSBA or DESE's comments. So, um, yes, thank you. Um, in a previous committee I was on, one of the, one of the uh, requests was to have a, and I don't see anything here, a PGO room of some sort that did not give full access to the building to parents and guardians who had projects to work on. Do you ever incorporate something like that into a building footprint? We, we've done uh, PTO or we've done PTO spaces. They're non-reimbursable. I see. Okay. Um, some communities felt we're, we're, we're just doing it. And then others, what we've done is worked with the, um, school to kind of give them their own corner. Mm -hmm. the, the other consideration too, which is not reimbursable by MSBA would be your after school programs. And we understand that need too. So again, you know, can we give a storage closet or something to them where they can store their stuff or we have, we have to work all that out too, but, um, just being fully transparent with MSBA is really important and they would not reimburse that space. Great, thank you. Um, moving up through the building and then we'll get to the site. On the second floor, the um, 
media center is off the stair from the main lobby. Um, adjacent to that, there is a, a suite with the art and STEM room. Um, OTPT and student support as you get toward the main academic part of the second floor with the first and second grade. Um, this stair could be open to the gym above at the second floor. Um, and it's an opportunity to bring light into the lobby in the heart of the building. Um, and we'll look at all sorts of ways to change the manipulation of the stair. It's currently showed, you know, not much larger than an egress stair, but there are all sorts of opportunities for changing geometry. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to stack completely at the first and second floor or even a third floor. And then we can introduce spaces in the middle to bring light down into the core of the building. And I think just if you if you just stay on that real quickly, you know, we're we're looking at ways that meet the program requirements, but also will allow for maximum use of space. So for example, and we haven't even had this conversation with the art folks yet, but um, we have the art and the STEM, right, to create this great steam area that would allow us to use the pretty pretty wide corridor for activity, project-based learning, et cetera. But you can see there's purple and light blue in between the two spaces. And again, just trying to maximize in shared resources that we've said, okay, well, we can combine the STEM storage and the art storage in one large space so that the resources can be shared as, as well as um, just instead of having two smaller spaces, one larger one that would allow for um, maximum storage use. Kathy? Yeah, I have a question on this. And then when you get to the third floor, I want to compare the third floor in this to the other third floor that you show us. So when I'm over at the media center and looking west, is the first floor extending out? So is the media center set back it's just a yeah. just pure purely what am i look i think the answer is yep. yes so yeah you've got a so step this back from the first floor to the second floor and then another step back to the third is that correct that is correct so this line it represents the roof as it exists of the first floor um the academic part is pretty compact going north, but the way the program is laid out with a priority to have the gym and the cafeteria and the public spaces on the first floor, there is an inherent imbalance so that the first floor is larger. Um, that is an opportunity um, to uh, adjust the massing and the volume of the building as you approach to create some visual interest and to make the building feel a little bit smaller. Um, you know, we have talked a lot about how the building should be compact as possible um, with as little as in and out. But, um, you know, this is going to strike a balance of the functional, putting everything where it wants to be. Um, it will, will serve the massing. Uh, but yes, uh, to answer your question in the simplest form, um, this is the extent of the library now looking west and there will be roof below it. Um, the aspect ratio, the shape of the media center and the cafeteria and the music room below it will be the focus of much study to make sure that that line is where it wants to be so that the, the building presents the appropriate face. Um, and then, you know, another consideration is uh, if you're looking at a decent amount of roof, what's on the roof outside of those windows? If it's a, a white roof, there could be glare, which, uh, you know, affects daylighting. And dirt. Um, <laughs> and dirt, yeah. So, uh, and then also all, all, we're going to put as much PV as we can on the roof. That area outside of the media center is probably not uh, a candidate because it will be in shade sometimes. Uh, but it's very possible that the media center line may move further to the west and this line further to the east so that um, if, if the administration is further out and that's further back, um, I'm, I'm talking through all sorts of 
pers uh, right. future, uh, but but the answer is yes. This is the roof beyond the. Uh, okay, and so just staying with this, it, partly this is we the music room got moved from the second floor down to the first floor, so that's part of what this extra. So the this literacy specialist that that X there is the gym, which is taller than everything else. So the mm -hmm. literacy specialist has a potential window on the south side and on the west side, correct? I mean, it, or just, and then media center has, well, definitely two-sided windows are, yeah. are potential, okay? Mm -hmm. And can you just then, the well, I should let you get to the third floor, but just trying to the third floor that's in this set versus the third floor that was um, in the earlier set. Sure. Um, um, well, let's go to the third floor. Um, <laughs> here, here is the academic room, and then it's obviously much smaller uh, because there is less program. Um, we do have to get to the stair here. Uh, the code occupancy for the um, third floor is, if you count all of the people who could possibly be in all the rooms, 500 people so therefore you need three stairs um we will look at ways of maybe creating another stair or as even one of the earlier options show that might condense this but this is an opportunity to give light to all of the offices and create sort of an unprogrammed node that is full of light uh that are are that we introduce into a lot of our projects and they they become some of the most successful and most used spaces in the school so could you go to the other the third floor i think two slides yep. up because what i'm looking at is where the teachers okay and you have to go way over to the, the just the third floor if it's possible because yep. this th this other third floor it has the same amount of stairs but it puts the teacher the staff room and the teacher's dining room south facing so they'd be looking out at the fields so just mm -hmm. thinking of um and and then it's squarer <laughs> than in the new version, which is like a little arrow coming out. So I just didn't know whether there's a reason for that. Um, and then with the teachers looking out toward where the kids are playing versus looking out toward where the, the loop is um, mm -hmm. and, and those two rooms. And then the other one, they're in this pointed out thing. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how else to do it. It's like a, a pencil. Nope, understood. Uh, that, that's uh, So the direction that the teacher workroom faces is um, if, if there's a state of preference that it wants to face north so it can overlook the fields and playground, that's, that is something that we can accommodate in either shape. Um, the difference between this box here and the arrow in the other plan is this building actually has four stairs um you can see three on the third floor but the fourth stair here doesn't go to the third floor because you're outside of the footprint um and what this third floor does it uses the same three stairs throughout the entire building okay so i see that so you could move it wouldn't have to be as pointed if people. So it would not have to be as pointed. That teacher's workroom could. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And okay. anything on the south here could be on the north, and anything on the north could be on the south. Um, but um, depending on what the view is, depending on the light quality that you want, if you'll notice on the second floor, we have the art room facing north, the media room facing north. Uh, because where kids are going to go in and do projects, we would like the quality of the white to be as 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 good as possible, as glare free. And yeah, North has the best daylighting without the glare and the heat. And then I think even Tim, if you go to the site plan, just go down one more. The views um, where we would be locating the south facing. Um, program and in, including the teachers that's still a beautiful view yeah um, it's very natural and um you know there's there's you're not looking at a street or a building so the orientation really is is wonderful that everyone is going to have these beautiful views of the natural surroundings um, 
Donna, I saw that, but yeah. but the pencil-like one, the view first looks down on the second floor and then the third, you know, it's it's because it stepped in. I don't have a good visual sense of this other than trying to think of what are you actually looking at? So yeah. that's the only thing I saw between the two third floors. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think, Kathy, um, our goal is to, you know, make this as uh, we have to maintain the 105, 750 gross square footage and um, at, at the preferred schematic, which is study, it's not even schematic design. You know, I, um, after speaking with people, we're realizing we had to throw in a little bit more area for mechanical. Now that we know it's geothermal, we had to, or ground source, we had to make sure that we had the right number of stairs, as Tim was saying. We're trying to, stairs are expensive, so we're trying to do that in a cost-effective manner. And then, of course, um, just accommodating the number, you have to count um, the number of people. We had to make sure we had enough toilets, uh, okay. multi-stall versus staff versus student versus gender neutral student. So, so um, some of the brown has a grown a little bit and what we're trying to do is also make the building as uh, compact as possible so you, you're going to see a, probably a couple more iterations but we recognize how important the special ed components are especially because you have the three district-wide programs here that we wanted to make sure they were as inclusive as possible and bringing the music down kind of started to juggle all of this but um your points are well taken did anyone before we jump to the site plan mike i don't know if you wanted to make any comments or if anyone else had any other comments as to the configuration of the spaces or uh, I mean, I think just reiterating that I appreciate, you know, getting the fact that you've been so proactive gathering feedback from staff who actually use the buildings. I know that'll continue. We get a, you know, now that school started, we, I know you're interested in, we tried to get everybody on, you know, or a large group uh, before the school year started. We got some, uh, particularly this, you know, um, focus on intense special needs, but then getting some general classroom teacher feedback in the classrooms. But, you know, I, I think for me, it really is, my personal viewpoint is just taking shape to be compact as I think Tim started with, uh, but also really promoting the type of collaboration that we value in our district and very consistent with our instructional model. So I'm really pleased that, you know, where we were two months ago to where we are today. I think there's been a lot of progress, positive progress and, and compliments to you all for really getting to know um, our teachers, our, you know, our, our teacher, you know, our uh, school leaders, but also folks working in the schools, you know, what's the best way to integrate some of the specialized programs, what's the best way to include some project area spaces that will promote, uh, especially the commandantes there, some uh, breaking down some of the walls that, you know, potentially because the commandantes is a, you know, unique program, but that the first grade team is a unified first grade team that's going to do a lot of things together. So it, to me, it's really starting to feel very much like an Amherst. It's not like the, you know, I've started, it was the boxes were in places because we needed them somewhere. And it feels much more uh, narrowly tailored to our needs here in Amherst. So I, I, I'm just very, very pleased with the progress and thank you. Hey, Jonathan. It kind of just touches a little bit on what Kathy was saying. I, you know, I, I'm sure the next time we see it, you'll have massaged the the that that kind of Western approach <laughs> to the building a little bit. Um, but that that uh, third floor feels a little little awkward to me um, from a form perspective because I'm kind of imagining it in my head uh, and what that would look in in 3D. There's a lot of um, kind of roof to wall. Uh, Kind of areas on both that second and third floor, so I'm going to be curious to see how you massage that a bit to to um, bring it together. And and we will we'll be um, starting to show you know the three dimensional models and how that um, impacts. I think. Yeah, I'm very curious to see a massing study at this point. Yeah, I've got yeah, one in my so, head, but it might yeah. be wrong. <laughs> but you know again we're going to continue to massage this a little bit but 
you know, the other thing too, in our mind is again, this is a, a pretty large building. So when you start doing the tiered effect, it really it does break down, the mass down. You're right. It breaks down the mass. And when you approach it, it's not looking like this big building, but we also want to be cognizant of area for PVs and how does that impact um, the the roofs and everything else. And then that 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 might impact the glare or whatever that would have on coming into the spaces above that roof. So we have to we we really our focus was to make sure we understood programmatically the right adjacencies and the function of it and making sure we met code with a number of stairs and toilets and and um, we think we're there and so now we have two months two <laughs> that's it uh, two months um, to kind of bring bring form to the building sorry Tim Okay. Uh, should we go to the site? Right. Um, the site has developed somewhat and will develop more. Um, I just want to point out uh, the things that have changed um, as they relate to the building and as they relate to the site itself. Um, as we talked about, the second entrance to the lobby moved from east of the service area to closer to the admin and a direct shot closer to the heart of the building. Um, you know, that that came out of one for the best place to enter the building. And two, we spoke to Rupert and Ben about the trash and service needs, which are um, significant and have to be accommodated within the context of the bus loop and people coming by and arriving for school every day. Um, so this option takes the Southern drop off loop and moves it to the West into this space that is, is probably not going to be utilized uh, as much as some of the areas and is, is and we wanna get as much queuing as possible. Um, and it also zones the Southern portion of the site uh, south of the building and a little bit better. Uh, we did have the drop off loop coming all the way almost to the end of the building. Uh, this way, uh, when there are outdoor learning opportunities, you're not looking beyond them to a drop off loop. And a lot of the, the natural point of where you wanna be is closer to the door rather than, you know, if the door was back here, people would stop or buses would stop. This entrance is just a, a better location. Um, there are other considerations that we have to bring into in terms of shielding uh, the dumpsters and service entrance, both for aesthetics and, and safety. Uh, but that is the general direction that the site is moving. And then just to add, um, taking into what we had heard earlier that what you see in blue, just for clarification, um, those those are not going to be rivers or waterways. Um, that those will be um, kind of stormwater retention basins. That if you went out there, you know, um, the water will move when it rains. But otherwise, you'll see. We had some photos. I don't know if we still have them in here, but uh, shallow areas that will have kind of like rocks or, or plantings that are gonna be natural. So we're just showing that there will be depressions um, through around the site to manage the storm water. But we also had heard that um, it was preferred that we kept the play areas kind of all together uh, with an access to outdoor learning, learning, but separate from the play so that kids are not distracted when they're hearing and seeing their friends play and they, they have a science class. So um, we're trying to be mindful of that as well. And then clear connection from the play to the cafeteria uh, for recess after for collection at drop off and dismissal, a clear entrance that is visible as you approach on the drive and also obvious from the parent drop off loop. Um, and then outdoor learning spaces um, distributed throughout the site. Kathy? 
Yeah, I a uh, couple of questions, um, and then also just a comment. Um, the where where might the basketball court be? And when it says asphalt, all that brown is some of that not asphalt, but um, another surface. Uh, and then then finally, I know I think you're going to try to set up a meeting with the recreation department staff. Um, so just thinking of the interaction with this as community space as well as school space. So when I asked about where the basketball court might be, it would be, you know, where might it be? <laughs> um, so, so it's not a, I don't, I can imagine where it might be, or I can imagine where you might put it. But when we, when we were at Sunita Williams, some of those play surfaces were like this rubberized stuff. Um, they weren't asphalt um they were soft to your feet and then we saw that probably too expensive for us great green fake green grass stuff that was like artificial turf so i'm just i know this is just a beginning but just trying to think of where things might be um mm -hmm. as you then meet with sure. recreation which will say where where do soccer fields, where baseball, but not necessarily the school, but the surrounding area. So those. Yeah. As, as shown here and, and included in the basis of design, these areas identified as play are the soft rubber surfacing where the play structures would be. The hardscape play is where basketball courts, whether those are full basketball courts or half courts, as maybe you've seen at some other, you know, is something that we'll talk and, and final program, but they would be in this zone. And then the athletic fields are, are beyond. Um, okay. And that, that is a discussion that we have to have about the, the shape and size of these athletic fields, because you know this is drawn as an ultimate Frisbee field, but that may not be the most useful shape or size for Parks and Rec, because uh, ultimate is often not played on a specific field. And they, they might need the flexibility to do something else. So that is the discussion that we have to have to fully develop the site. Because soccer teams use it, use these fields now. So, yeah. um, so my other question is these outdoor learning spaces. Um, you know, if outdoor learning includes gardens um, where you're planting things or outdoor learning includes, you're just gonna pull some mats and you're gonna sit around in a circle. The surface on that, can it be if it's a school, can it be um, something other than rubber or asphalt? Can it be grass? Can it be, um, you know, nice fine wood chips? I mean, we saw some spaces at Sonoma Williams where they had a space in the forest, which was just, mm -hmm. you could sit on some rocks and be in a circle. So, you know, how naturalistic can those be? Um, it, they, they can be naturalistic. All of those materials are on the table for outdoor learning spaces. We will need to get an accessible route there, but an accessible route can happen on a stone dust path. Um, so um, all of those materials are on the option. We, you know, limit the asphalt or hardscape to places where they have to be shoveled, cleared in the winter. Um, obviously, there are games of four square basketball that want to take place on those, but um, I wouldn't say that asphalt is the default exterior material. It's just there for when it serves a, a, a very real purpose for, um, you know, making sure that the, this, the games can be played and it's uh, available during all seasons when kids want to go out in the winter and it's not yeah. super nice out. And then just to add, um, it is a durable material to allow for emergency vehicles to access around the building, which will be really important as well. Can I step in here for a second? Um, I have to leave. I think you still have a quorum, uh, Kathy. Okay, let's see, because Alicia had to leave too, yeah. but Allison did join us. So I just have to... I think I count six other people here. If there's six other people. Okay, so you're turning... So I'm, you're making me host. I it, am uh, do that, yes. The most is, is what you're telling me. Good. Yeah, okay, <laughs> thank, thank you. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Okay. So Mike has his hand up. I ask a clarifying question. If you see six left, would that be a quorum or would that be one fewer than a quorum? Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I, I mean, I have a comment, but before I get it, I think that was more important than my comment. Yeah, let's see. One, two, 
three. I only four. see five. And even if it's six, I thought seven was what we needed for quorum. Yeah, we're gonna, get, we're gonna need seven. Okay. okay. So then um, I will not make my comment. I'll figure out a different way to communicate it just because if we're gonna end the meeting, then we need to end the meeting. Well, so, but then I, we won't have had um, public comment. So, okay. So I can hang out. I can hold people off for a couple of minutes. So let's, let's complete okay. our work. So, is that okay? And then we can take yep. up where we left off and send in comments. Um, and I know you had the daylighting slides. We potentially have a presentation, but anyway, we can rejigger next week. Next, not next week, September 16th. Um, so we're open for public comments. And there are, okay. Chris Riddle, you have joined us. And I'm seeing one, two, three, four people had their hands up. So I'm going to ask everyone to try to stay to the three minutes or less because we're at risk of losing a full quorum. So Chris, you're here if you want to unmute. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, tell me if uh, Rudy is one of the persons with a raised hand. Yes. Yes. Okay, I won't say what he's going to say. Um, I, I'm commenting about the uh, what I would what I would say as uh, I mean I, I I was really taken by the um, Lexington Children's Place. It's colorful and its spirit and its child and its uh, capriciousness. Um, uh, so I and also I would like to call people's attention to the King Open School in Cambridge, massive new net zero school. Um, uh, there aren't um, recesses and projections in either of these two things, not many. And I I think that we uh, I'm I'm looking at the floor plans and seeing I counted the number of corners in the south in the south elevation. And there are 18. Every time you do a corner, there's a temp temptation to change materials there. Imagine that would be the, we would go from brick to uh, uh, masonry, for instance, at one of those corners. Uh, there, each time you do that, that's expensive. And uh, and I don't and I'm I I don't feel that this building is big enough that it does it needs uh, too many ins and outs and jigs and jogs. Um, I would like to call attention to those two other projects, which are mostly uh, straight lines. And at King Open School, they, there are uh, curves that, uh, form, that soften the profile of the building, but no ins and outs and jigs and jogs. I, I would like to call people's attention to the, those ins and outs and jigs and jogs. And let's try to avoid that. And let's try to avoid changing materials just in order to change materials. Um, that is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Maria, you're you're with us. Thank you. Uh, uh, we kind of get booted out, so uh, it, it's hard to know when we're back in. Okay, um, so I would like to. Um, I love the idea of having a grid to understand all the different important considerations for the exterior materials, cost, durability, maintenance, that kind of thing. If you could also add to that climate impact. Uh, in terms of, I know that this is basically a facade and it may not have a big impact on uh, insulating or thermal uh, capabilities, but if it does, that would be nice to know as well as carbon footprint um, of the different materials. The other thing is uh, I, I, do, I am very happy to hear that you're going to be uh, reaching out about the community spaces and the field use and um, all the kinds of uh, other outdoor uses, and I would encourage uh, encourage that uh, not only from Amherst Rec, but there are, I know that there is a bunch of other uh, organizations besides Amherst Rec that that uses these fields. So 
that's uh, I'll I'll try to keep it brief. And thank you. I just I want to thank this committee once again for always recording um, and having this available so that people can watch it. Really, truly appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. I think we brought in Rudy and then Bruce. Hi, um, thank you, Rudy from Rudy Perkins from Amherst, Mass. Um, Kathy, I counted nine up from committee members on originally, and you're losing two, right? So don't you still have seven? Um, if we lose Paul, we Alicia's gone. Alicia's gone, and Paul's gone. And you had and, Paul and, and Sean. Uh, so, Sean's gone. Okay, so you've dropped a six. Yeah, okay. we're counting. I think we're this time we're counting right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Um, I think uh, you know I like some of the points that Mike and Paul and others made about color. That this is an elementary school it should be a little livelier. Um, this is also our first net zero building. So just the way the Prius, when it came out, had a distinctive shape to communicate not just a new car, but that a different approach to a car was being done. I think this building needs to be a little distinctive and not maybe totally traditional with a nod to tradition, but uh, a little bit novel and using color and other things. I think the river side of the building can be your cheapest, most uh, plain, um, building facade material because very few people will see that end. So put more of the expenditures onto the more visible ends, particularly the west end. Um, the um, I just hope that somebody is looking at, uh, oh, uh, that gym wall projecting up presents the possibility of some kind of mural or pattern like a sun pattern or some kind of thing that also helps emphasize the end of the building that is the predominant end, the entrance end. So that could be like a billboard effect above maybe a parallel thing of sculpture or something at the end. I thought you might wanna think about that. Um, the sun motif might go with uh, PV and the net zero. Um, I hope somebody on the committee or at finance committee is looking at the new uh, Inflation Reduction Act, not just for the solar credits that I mentioned in my email to you all, but I believe the geothermal also is going to get federal credits and may be subject to direct pay requirements. My understanding is that some of these have uh, domestic content requirements, so it's going to impact our specifications on some of the materials and how things are done. Federal prevailing wage, I believe, is required and so forth. So I hope we don't lock our to preempt things by how we spec and do the building. And I hope, I don't know whose job that is to go through the IRA and look at how we can get all as many federal subsidies as possible out of the new legislation. But I hope we're looking at that. Um, and I agree with Chris that we should reduce the zigzagging. Looks to me like the Eastern edge of the building could be squared off by lining up the last two classrooms with the others in that line, that'll change, that'll actually pull the edge of the building away from the, the river area, which might be beneficial. And then you could um, reconfigure some of the storage and other components in that hallway, which would become wider if you line up the uh, those classrooms. So uh, I think that's it. If you get a chance, architects or others, to look at the Iowa rest area called, it has Iowa written all over it. It is, it really struck me in my travels this summer. Um, it used a giant sculpture at the entrance uh, and stained black concrete to look like ink spilling out towards the countryside. It was just black and white and yet it was ter tremendously dramatic to my, my eye and maybe we can learn something from that. But um, anyway, thanks. Thank you, Rudy. and. Bruce. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, comment on the uh, exterior treatment. 
uh, generally speaking, uh, the, the buildings chosen looked very busy. And, uh, and, and I appreciate that when you're trying to show uh, the committee a, a range of materials, you probably would choose buildings that had a variety of choices within them. But my sense is that um, so far as uh, some guiding points for exterior treatment, I urge the committee to favor uh, the selection or the choice of, a, of, a, of a, a, a clearly dominant single material, that the building should echo, uh, express that, a clearly dominant single material. And, and because it's very likely to be brick, I guess, because of the economics associated with it in all ways, um, my second thought would be then that uh, uh, the, using the polychromatic potential of brick to uh, make the building uh, less intimidating, more welcoming, uh, more school-like would be a, a second good strategy. I, uh, I think the durable base uh, that uh, has been discussed and, and the reasons for it are, uh, is a third driver. Um, and, uh, and also it's a, it's, a, it's a purely classical thing to tie the building to the ground, make it looks like it belongs there. So, and then the fourth uh, guide that would seem to me to be a, a, a good strong driver would be the, uh, the whimsical color. I, I'm uh, like others uh, favoring that there should be some strong primary uh, whimsical coloring in the building that, that uh, drives it in the direction of making it feel like an elementary school. So a single dominant uh, material and, and not so much of the accents. I think the Maria Hastings uh, of all of the buildings that were shown seemed to be the one that was most closely um, um, heading in that direction. But it, 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 in my view, was still a little busier than I think uh, uh, would be desirable. Thank you. And, and congratulations, I, as, as Michael was saying, I, uh, he thinks this project is moving in a very good direction. And from a wholly different point of view of a public citizen observing the process, I would agree. You're muted, Kathy. And I'm talking, so that's not good. Um, I don't see any other hands up on the committee. So I think we're going to adjourn so we don't lose a quorum. And yep. we will send out the tentative agenda. It sounds like the next meeting will need to be a full two hours. Um, so um, I'm going to check with people. I know uh, Allison needed to join late today because of, of school starting and Alicia. So I'm just, I, I think we're getting to the point where um, you're going to want input and decisions from us, or at least having us all here because we can't just look at these slides. And then my last thought is of the people where we just saw these slides, I'm assuming we can just send you comments on slide number X, Y, or Z. Um, and I'm happy to collect them if, if committee members just want to send them to me and I'll, I'll pull them together. So I think with that said, we are adjourned.